Continuing production of The Open Mind has been made possible by grants from the Rosalind P. Walter Foundation, the Bluestein Family Foundation, the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation, Carnegie Corporation of New York, the Russell Sage Foundation, the Malkin Fund, May and Samuel Rudin Family Foundation, and from the corporate community, Mutual of America. I'm Richard Hefner, your host on The Open Mind, a title that hopefully pays due tribute to free thought and free speech. Of course, it's difficult these days to take a reasoned, measured view of free speech issues when they and American values historically associated with them are threatened as severely as they have been in these first years of our new century. Too often, one's instinct is to rush to the barricades instead loudly proclaiming one's most politically correct credentials as free speech absolutist, even impugning the motives of those who instead seek balanced judgment when there is tension between the conflicting values of a decent society, as between free press and fair trial, between the politicalization of our courts and judicial candidates' unlimited speech, between real, not imagined, national security needs and speech that threatens to endanger them, between personal privacy and its many press invasions. However, my guest today never has been on such an absolutist automatic pilot himself, even though as a two-time Pulitzer Prize winning New York Times reporter and op-ed columnist for over a half century, Anthony Lewis has been for so many of us our own totally trusted and valued free speech ombudsperson. Now, Gideon's Trumpet, one of Tony Lewis's earlier books, a brilliant account of a 1963 Supreme Court case establishing defendants' rights to court-appointed counsel, is a classic of our legal literature. Well, now published by Basic Books, his Freedom for the Thought That We Hate, a biography of the First Amendment, promises to become one too. And I'd like first today to read you his new book's opening paragraph and then ask Tony Lewis how pleased he really is with the conditions it describes. Ours is the most outspoken society on earth. Americans are freer to think what we will and say what we think than any other people and freer today than in the past. We can bear the secrets of government and the secrets of the bedroom. We can denounce our rulers and each other with little fear of the consequences. There is almost no chance that a court will stop us from publishing what we wish in print, on the air, or on the web. Hateful and shocking expression, political or artistic, is almost all free to enter the marketplace of ideas. And Tony, it's your first paragraph and I wonder how much you wrap yourself around those seemingly very positive thoughts. Well, I express my beliefs. I think uh, that's the kind of country we are and should continue to be. Yet so much of the rest of the book takes some expression uh, that uh, seems to me to be negative about these points. Is that unfair reading on my part? No, because as you said in your introduction, uh, I've never been an absolutist, and, and I think there are other values in life important as freedom of expression is, and I think it is fundamental. That's the nature of this country, and it's right at the heart of our existence. But there are other values. Uh, privacy, you mentioned, is one, um, and we can talk about that, but uh, it doesn't make me less enthusiastic, and I'm, I'm afraid I'm quite romantic or enthusiastic in the book about free speech, 
um, and, and the struggle to make it a reality because although it was written into the Constitution in 1791 in the First Amendment, it was never enforced by the Supreme Court for 140 years. The first case in which anybody actually won on a claim of the right to speak or print was 1931. Now that's 140 years without judicial enforcement. Then why have we come at this point, <clears throat> perhaps I should say, how have we come at this point to being uh, so uh, extraordinary, as you describe it, in our devotion to free speech? It's been a hard-won devotion, I'd say. Um, I'll give you an example. At the end of World War I, or toward the end, President Wilson, a truly bad civil libertarian, anti-civil libertarian, persuaded Congress to pass the Sedition Act, which made it a crime to say anything that might discourage recruitment for the armed forces or look badly on the war, and it was a very sweeping statute. Um, a group of radicals threw pamphlets from the top of a building in New York criticizing President Wilson for sending American troops to Russia after the Bolshevik Revolution. Just political criticism of a kind that we would assume to be protected now and surely would be. Uh, they were charged under the Sedition Act and uh, convicted and sentenced to 20 years in prison. That's what it was like. Uh, under the Sedition Act and state copies of it, thousands of Americans were imprisoned for anodyne, sorry, anodyne criticism uh, of the war or the way it was being handled, the kind of thing we say about the Iraq war now about every two minutes. Um, and uh, we had to overcome that tradition uh, of repression. And it was done partly by powerful rhetorical dissents in the Supreme Court by Justices Holmes and Brandeis, who gradually persuaded the rest of the court and the country that free speech was a fundamental value. That's what happened. Do you think it's an absolute switch? Do you have any concerns at any point that uh, having switched the way we did at the beginning of the last century, we might find ourselves switching back again? I don't see that happening now. I think there's <clears throat> too much support for freedom of expression in this country. And interestingly, unlike so many other issues, it goes across the political spectrum. Conservatives as well as liberals at least profess devotion to freedom of expression. Now, if there's some kind of expression that you really dislike, you, you can you very often hear people saying, well, I'm for free speech, but that goes too far, or I don't think you should be allowed to do that. Of course, the point of the title of this book, Freedom for the Thought That We Hate, that's an expression of Justice Holmes, is that we have to um, be able to stand things we don't like. That's the way the system is if you want freedom. And as I read the book, I see Tony Lewis writing at points about the coarseness of expression in our society. And I feel that you, as you write that, are rather regretful about that coarseness. I'd rather be living in a Jane Austen novel, you mean. <laughs> yes, and you say as much. <laughs> well, yes, I would. I personally would think it was um, would be nicer to live in a more elegant society. But that has never been America. Back when Madison, James Madison, was writing the First Amendment, putting it into the Constitution, uh, there was the utmost vulgarity and excess in speech. And newspapers were very often owned or uh, edited by political party hacks. Um, people wrote uh, devastating things about politicians. For example, the story about alleging an affair, a long-running affair, between Thomas Jefferson and Sally Hemings, his slave, uh, appeared originally in a newspaper article at, in the 18th century. I mean, we were, we've been uninhibited from the start. Now, why did we begin? I used the term in the first place, but you um, uh, accepted it, said Tony Lewis is no absolutist. Uh, what do you mean by that? I mean, well, let's take privacy, for example. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> There was a case, I have to talk about a case, that's the way I think. Please. Uh, called Time, Inc. against Hill. Uh, Mr. Hill's family lived outside of Philadelphia. The home was invaded by three escaped convicts, and they were held in the house for several days. 
convicts treated them perfectly nicely. They didn't threaten them. They didn't do anything to them, but they just kept them in the house. Then the convicts left, and they were killed or captured by the police. And it was a huge story and had a very <coughs> somber impact on the Hill family, especially Mrs. Hill, who was a very nervous people, a person who didn't like publicity. The Hills left Philadelphia, moved to a remote part of Connecticut to escape the publicity. And a few years later, a play called The Desperate Hours opened on Broadway, and it was about escaped convicts holding people prisoner in their house. Uh, it was quite different from the Hill story. The, the convicts were abusive. They threatened to rape the daughter. They beat up the father, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but Life magazine did a feature on the play, which it decided to have the actors uh, photographed in the former home of the Hills in Philadelphia and uh, treated it as if it were the Hill story. Mr. Hill sued for invasion of privacy in the article. Uh, he won a modest judgment in New York, uh, $25,000. But the case was taken by Time Incorporated to the Supreme Court, where Mr. Hill was represented by Richard Nixon uh, in a, as a private lawyer between political engagements. And uh, ultimately, after some back and forth within the court and two arguments, Mr. Hill lost. By five to four, the Supreme Court said that the interest of Life magazine in freedom of expression um, trumped uh, Mr. Hill's uh, concerned about the impact on his family. Well, years later, Nixon's law partner at the time, Leonard Garment, wrote an article for the New Yorker magazine about the case and its consequences. And in it he said that uh, Mrs. Hill was diagnosed by psychiatrists as suffering from extreme fragility. And two years after this event, she committed suicide. Now, I think that case was wrongly decided. I think the value of privacy in that case exceeded the value, the, the right of Life magazine to publish a misleading article. Do you think that if the five to four vote had been the other way, there would have been consequences with which you would have been as unhappy? Uh, there would certainly have been consequences. I can't tell. I'd have to know the particulars to know whether I'd have been unhappy. Uh, but certainly the fear of those consequences drove the majority on the court. Justice Black, the, the greatest advocate of the First Amendment in the Supreme Court of that time, Hugo Black, warned that if editors were held to that kind of standard, uh, you know, especially a feature magazine like Life, uh, which told lots of stories, and they might get things wrong, uh, they might invade people's privacy, and he said that's the price of free journalism, and well, that's the view on that side. I think modest damages uh, once in a while might not be so bad for us. Now, Tony, wait a minute. What kind of principle would that be? Modest damages once in a while. When do you know that there is a real concern at the level of our highest court for privacy? Well, the court has never really expressed that concern. Uh, the Supreme Court of the United States has never shown a great liking for the idea of privacy. It was articulated, the value of privacy was articulated brilliantly by Justice Brandeis, uh, who said the right to be let alone, his wonderful phrase for privacy, uh, the right to be let alone is the right most valued by civilized men. Well, I happen to think that privacy is a very important value. Now, we don't have much of it today. The young people let it all hang out on some blog or other. And they don't value privacy, but I do. I think it's an important part of one's uh, soul. But you see, this is where this very wonderful book, Freedom for the Thought That We Hate, uh, puzzles me. Because I hear what you say now, and I read in the book that concern, and you express it for a decent society. When do you advocate a legal court structure that supports your picture of a decent society? And when do you say, let it all hang out? That's the American tradition. <clears throat> Letting it hang out is the American tradition up to a point. But the First Amendment has never been defined uh, by the Supreme Court as absolute. The court has resolutely rejected that claim. And it's always taken into, uh, other interests into account. I mean, uh, some of them are built right into the Constitution. Copyright, for example, or 
blackmail. Blackmail uses expression. You can blackmail somebody on the phone or in a letter. That's writing or speech, but it's punishable. Uh, you know, it's not an absolute, and we have other values, and it's the job of the courts to say which one prevails in a particular case. And what you say in your introduction, that what prevails in the United States of America at this point in our history is something that is almost absolute. Almost. And I like it that way, as long as we have the almost. Because you like that tension. I like the tension, yes. <laughs> Maybe it makes a better story. And always the newsman. But always the newsman, let me question you about that. Um, uh, the Sullivan case uh, decided well, decided ill. Oh, very well. Should I uh, say what it is? Please. Um, Your paper. Yes. At the time of the Civil Rights Movement, led by Dr. King, um, the New York Times published an advertisement which, uh, which, which was for uh, the movement and Dr. King and, and sought support for them, financial and otherwise. And in the course of the ad, it criticized Southern officials for being abusive and cruel toward civil rights demonstrators. Um, it didn't mention the names of any Southern officials. It called them Southern violators of the Constitution. But one official, L.B. Sullivan, of a, a counselor or commission member of the city of Montgomery, Alabama, said the ad might refer to him, might be taken by citizens of Alabama as referring to him and was libelous. And he sued for libel, and he won the largest libel judgment in Alabama history before an all-white jury and a case handled by a judge who loved the Confederacy so much that he sat the, seated the jurors in his courtroom in Confederate military uniforms. Wonderful. One of the wonderful stories you tell in this book. <laughs> um, well, the case went on up to the Supreme Court. Now, what's interesting, you'd think that a, a lawsuit that was so obviously political uh, and in which huge damages had been awarded, $500,000, um, to a man whose name wasn't even mentioned, you'd think that was an easy case. But it wasn't, because until then, libel had always been considered outside the First Amendment's protection. No libel judgment, however huge or you know, peculiar, ha had ever been upset on the grounds of the First Amendment. But in this case, the Supreme Court laid down a new rule that a public official could not recover libel damages, could not win a libel suit, unless he or she showed that a mistaken statement about him or her had been made with knowledge of its falsity, that is a deliberate lie, or with reckless disregard for the truth or falsity. Uh, that's been a tremendous protection for the press. It, I think it paved the way to the coverage of Vietnam and Watergate, and uh, I think it's a wonderful decision. But you point out, too, that it paved the way for a further extension from public officials to public figures. And how do you feel about that extension? I have mixed feelings about it. I think if it's extended to people who take part in public life, who, as the court said in one case, thrust themselves into the vortex of public controversy, uh, then it's appropriate that they be treated the same way. When you get into public issues, um, you know, you expose yourself to criticism. That's the game. That's how politics works in this country. Uh, but it also applies to to, say, film stars and other people who are uh, just famous but have nothing to do with the government, and I don't think it should have been extended to that. I think it weakens the logic of the decision. The opinion in Sullivan was written by Justice Brennan, and he said it engaged the central meaning of the First Amendment, which is the right to criticize those who govern us, and I think that's what it should be about. And you would limit it, if you could, to public officials. Oh, I would, but it's an issue has long since gone away, and everybody's living under the rule of public figures as well. And I, you know, I was against it at the time, but it's become part of the law, and it's all over. That that's strange for you to say. It seems to me you've you've indicated in so many uh, uh, in the book and elsewhere that the law is, as Mr. Dooley said what the judges say it is, or the Constitution is. Um, do you accept change only in one direction? Can't we anticipate it might flow in the other direction? Oh, it does. It does flow in all directions. That's the nature of uh, the court. Then why the acceptance and the satisfaction in saying, well, 
that's the way it is. Because I think there isn't any great movement to change it, it's not likely to happen. That's, I'm just dealing realistically with the situation. Certain things, for good or ill, uh, become settled. Justice Brandeis said, ordinarily, it is better that a rule be settled than, uh, it's more important that a rule be settled than it, whether it's right or wrong. What do you see as likely to change things that seem to be settled now in this area of the First Amendment? I don't actually think the First Amendment is likely, an interpretation of the First Amendment is likely to change radically in the near future. Uh, there aren't any great cases pending that challenge the fundamentals of the First Amendment, and that's for an interesting reason. Although we have a tormented history in, in which uh, repeatedly there have been waves of repression in the United States against speech during times of war, like World War I, as I mentioned earlier, or times of fear, the McCarthy period. Um, despite that, there is today a very broad consensus, and unlike so many other issues, it goes across the political spectrum. Pol conservatives as well as liberals generally support the idea of freedom of expression. One conservative member of Congress said to me once, you know, I'm, I, I like to have free speech too. <laughs> as if that were a surprise. So it is, uh, maybe you're touching upon here, my, my good friend Garrett Broad pointed out that um, it may well be that we're talking about our own interests in all of this. I would like free speech too. I don't want my uh, speech to be limited in any way. Is that the point? Uh, that is the point, but you have to give credit here. Uh, people may say that, but very often they don't really want to give it to the other fellow, uh, and especially if it's somebody with a radically different view, uh, or somebody, shall we say, who makes a speech about the wonders of Islam, or something that's alien and strange to you as a person. <clears throat> you don't, you may say you believe in free speech generally, but that worries you, and that's perfectly understandable. Uh, but I think there is a broader acceptance now of the general need for, <clears throat> as the title says, freedom for the thought that we hate. Well, um, Garrett had said to me, what about freedom from the thoughts that we hate? Because you indicate in this quite extraordinary book the numbers of areas, when you use the expression a decent society, I would say a good society, and where things based on free speech principles lead us away from what you would consider a decent society. Uh, what about freedom for you? for me, for everyone, uh, from the thoughts that we hate? Well, generally speaking, I'm dubious that we should be free from thoughts that we hate because down that path is <laughs> we get to repression. And uh, we get to the idea that somebody whose views are different from ours um, uh, should be censored, and I'm against that. Well, I probably shouldn't have used the expression thoughts, because that's the, that's the word that you use here. That's Holmes's word. But, well, yes, <clears throat> and you accept the notion in this very first paragraph <clears throat> that I read from, the very last words, and I want to ask you about that. We don't have much time in this program, but you promised to do a sit for a second program, too. The marketplace of ideas, I was surprised to find you using that expression because it's used so often today. And when I say thoughts that we hate or that we like, aren't those thoughts, aren't they supposed to be political thoughts? When we talk about the marketplace of ideas and um, there are those who take the sleaziest uh, descriptions, pictures, etc and say, in the marketplace of ideas, this has to be free. But haven't we mixed up political ideas with expression that is not political, that is coarse, to use the word you use in the book? Generally speaking, I think the First Amendment has to be read to cover both political ideas, although the relationship to government and the protecting the right to criticize government is, as Justice Brennan said in the Sullivan case, the central meaning of the First Amendment. But it's been interpreted for years to cover artistic speech and other non-political matters, and I think quite rightly so. I mean, for example, uh, early in the 20th century, the federal government banned James Joyce's book, Ulysses. 
Well, Ulysses is quite widely regarded as the greatest novel of the 20th century, like it or not. And uh, fortunately, a wonderful federal judge, John Woolsey, uh, threw the federal government's position out of court. But we've been through these waves of censorship of artistic matters, the Anthony Comstock laws. You know, of course, sexual expression has become very vulgar, and I regret that. It's not Jane Austen. Um, but, um, you know, once you go down the road of censorship, who's going to say where it will stop? Well, one might say, <coughs> once you go down the road of coarseness, it isn't Jane Austen. Where do you stop? And you've made the point yourself, we're not stopping, we're continuing. Partly and that's for road. reasons of technology. It's become so easy with a push of the button on your computer to get the most vulgar uh, image that you can imagine. Uh, that it's really impossible to stop. So the argument, the nice intellectual argument about sex and censorship has been overtaken by a technical, technological revolution. You see that going on and on and on. I don't know any way to stop it. Would you, if you did? I don't think so. So this session, which is going to end right now, leads me to wonder whether you are an absolutist or not when it comes to matters of speech. Uh, well, I'm not, and um, perhaps another time I can tell you why not. Well, okay, we're going to end this program now, and you'll sit where you are, and I'm going to ask you and make that next program the other time. Thank you so much, Tony Lewis, for joining me today on The Open Mind. It's a pleasure. And thanks, too, to you in the audience. I hope you'll join us as well next time. And for transcripts of today's program, please send $4 in check or money order to The Open Mind, P.O. Box 7977, FDR Station, New York, New York, 10150. Meanwhile, as another old friend used to say, good night and good luck. Continuing production of The Open Mind has been made possible by grants from the Rosalind P. Walter Foundation, the Bluestein Family Foundation, the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation, Carnegie Corporation of New York, the Russell Sage Foundation, the Malkin Fund, May and Samuel Rudin Family Foundation, and from the corporate community, Mutual of America.